I mean, I'm not an economic theorist, and honestly, I don't really understand how the economy works. BreadTube is a loose collection of video essayists who've gained popularity in recent years. It sprung up largely as a response to the sea of alt-right content on YouTube, but has developed into its own space over time. The big three bread tubers are generally considered to be ContraPoints, PhilosophyTube, and HBomberGuy. You can add other big channels like Sean, Big Joel, Innuendo Studios, Vorsch, but in all cases, BreadTube is largely focused on things like gender, LGBTQ rights, media, Ben Shapiro takedowns, and the series of existential crises that we find ourselves embroiled in. All noble causes, but largely not economics. In fact, there was a thread about this on the BreadTube subreddit not too long ago. I would like this channel to help fill in the gap in economics content, and in this short series I want to comment directly on the few times where major bread tubers have discussed economics, because I think there are some, um, issues. But I don't want to come off as pedantic. If you internet, you've probably heard some people use you don't understand economics as a trump card in debates, and I don't see it this way. To me, saying you don't understand economics is just like saying you don't understand sociology or you don't understand history both of which you could say to me, if you really wanted to hurt my feelings. We all have blind spots, and I'm hoping I can add something to our understanding. And economics is important. It is, rightly or wrongly, the language of policy. Economists also have direct political influence. The media continually talk about the economy, even during a pandemic. Our understanding of economics needs to be better to challenge the status quo. So, the example I'm going to use today comes from one of Ollie Thorne at Philosophy Tube's videos about the housing market. He argues that we need to abolish the housing market altogether in order to secure housing for everyone. I know this video is from a couple of years ago, but I see no indication that Ollie has changed his thinking. Actually, he repeated a core argument of the video less than a year ago, as we'll see. And although my video is focused on the housing market, hopefully it will give us some more general ways of thinking about when capitalism and markets seem to work and when they don't. I'm going to present quite a few different arguments and proposals, and you might disagree with some of them, which is a good thing. I'm not trying to preach to people, I'm trying to give you the tools to make up your own mind. So let's take a little look at the video in question. In his typical style, Ollie makes his video engaging by putting things in a comic book context. What if our hero, housing market, and our villain, housing crisis, are actually one and the same? The reason I think that housing market has never quite managed to defeat housing crisis is because they're actually one and the same character. I must confess, guys, that this video will not be as fun as Ollie's, but this does have the advantage of being correct. And I'll just take this moment to give an honourable shout out to Mexi. She has some pretty good videos about economics in general, and even in this one she gives a solid account of why loosening planning restrictions isn't a solution to the housing crisis. She's an exception, so we'll excuse her from the general charge of bad economics. For now. Returning to Ollie, his central case seems to hinge around the following comparison. Suggesting that key features of the housing market logically imply key features of the housing crisis. What does housing market actually do? Well, he distributes homes to people who can't afford them. He encourages developers to develop more. He lends money to people so they can get on the property ladder. Hang on. Those are all the exact corollaries of the villain's powers. Distributing homes only to people who can afford them is just the other side of the coin of housing crisis power to raise rents and increase house prices. Encouraging developers to develop more is what led to the birth of gentrification, one of the series' darkest secondary evildoers. And lending money to buyers was the basis of the villain's plot in the 2008 storyline Crisis of Infinite Subprime Mortgages. I'm just not convinced that the left-hand side of this follows from the right-hand side. And we need to do a lot more to make the case that the housing market doesn't work. Otherwise, we'll end up saying things that don't make sense. For example, in his Chernobyl video last year, Ollie restated part of his argument in even stronger terms. Thatcher's criterion for responsibility was owning property. And the problem there is, that is a thing that is mathematically impossible for everyone to do at the same time. You cannot have a housing market and no homeless people. Because if everybody has secure housing, you cannot sell them housing. Okay, just hear me out. What if everybody owned a house but some people still wanted to move? For like, jobs or family or a change of scenery. What do you think about that, huh? Speechless. Could we not equally apply his reasoning to other markets? 
Why does distributing things to people who can afford them mean that some will be excluded? It could be that everyone can afford something. For example, in rich countries, basically everyone can afford an apple. Nobody speaks about the apple crisis. Well, okay, that's a bad example, but you get my point. It's still going to be profitable for firms to sell to people, even if everyone can buy. But apples and houses obviously differ in important ways. And thinking about this could help us understand why the housing market fails, while the apple market, for the most part, doesn't. Okay, so the first thing about apples is that they have what we might call good market feedback mechanisms. Advocates of capitalism will generally argue that the profit motive incentivizes firms to produce good products, because if it's not good enough, consumers will just vote with their feet and take their business elsewhere. Apples are bought and sold quite regularly. There are readily available substitutes like oranges or bananas. They can be moved around and stored easily, and they have pretty clear characteristics for what makes them good or bad. You know, are these apples bad? Yes or no, is a question one might ask. This means that capitalism works, at least for consumers, as they can change where they buy apples and firms can respond to these choices. Contrast this with houses. Unless you're a celebrity, buying a house probably isn't something you do very often. It's legally and logistically complicated, so most people can't navigate the transaction themselves and they need an intermediary, an estate agent. There's already a problem here because you're reliant on them for the information about potential homes. If you think the estate agents did a bad job of finding you a home, you won't go to another one next week. In fact, by the time you move again, you've probably forgotten the name of the estate agents. What are you, some kind of real estate agent? Ah, oh, he's a realtor. There is a difference somehow. It's also difficult to know if they've even done a bad job in the first place. Houses are kind of complicated to evaluate. There are loads of things about a house that you have to balance. How spacious it is, the location, the number of bedrooms, the quality of the bathroom and kitchen, whether the neighbors ask you to go dogging with them. There's a huge difference between looking around a house and living in it, and every house will ultimately have some unforeseen disadvantages. You can't know if you've picked the best one because you won't get an opportunity to compare living in it to living in others that were on the market at the same time. These complications all mean that you can be misled about both the state of the market and individual homes. So you're much more reliant on trust, norms, and when those fail, government regulations. I mean, why do you think grocers have reputations as nice couples with West Country accents, while estate agents have reputations as dodgy shucksters? It's awfully small. I'd say it's awfully cozy. That's dilapidated. Rustic. That house is on fire. Motivated seller. So we've got that market feedback mechanisms don't work very well for housing as compared to apples. But you're probably thinking there's a bit more to it than that. So let's move on to the second point in our table. To understand this one better, let's take a visit to Rightmove and take a look at two houses. One is a three bedroom house with three floors and it looks pretty nice to be honest. It's got all the trimmings and a garden. It's safe to say that this could comfortably house a family. The other is a one bedroom flat and it's clearly well below the standard of the house. Now let's play a game. How much do you think each of these costs? That's right, they're the same price. But what I haven't told you is where they are. The bigger, nicer house is in Coventry, whereas the flat is in London. That's how bad London is for house prices, and it wasn't even one of the expensive areas. A lot of the value of housing derives from its location. Economists sometimes think of this as the land the housing is built on, as opposed to the structure itself. And in my experience, this is not a distinction which is obvious to most people. To be honest, it doesn't sound very groundbreaking. Haha, <laughs> get it? Actually, it just sounds kind of boring and technocratic, but it has some pretty radical implications. Most of the rise and volatility in house prices over the past few decades has actually been driven by land. Everyone needs a house, and you simply have no choice. The location of a given house is basically unique. Landowners, therefore, always have some kind of monopoly power. And there can also be unique features of the buildings themselves which increase this. When you know that land is a monopoly, you can start to see some new solutions. Land taxes, much beloved of the followers of the 19th century economist Henry George, are one way to take away the excess money from the landowners and give it back to the community. Land taxes would also increase the cost of hoarding lots of space, a point to which we will return shortly. And price controls such as on rent may prevent them from exploiting their position. Returning to Ollie's video, remember that we are trying to link the points on the right with the points on the left. So how does land relate to issues like affordability, homelessness, and gentrification? 
When the supply of something is fixed, it's easier for the price to be bid up, especially if inequality is high and rich people want it. You may be familiar with the name Calvin Klein, but did you know that he owns three entire floors of a tower in a prime location in Manhattan? Did you know that rich people have started installing enormous swimming pools in these multi-story apartments? In Economics for the Rest of Us, Mosh Adler argues that increased inequality has bid up the limited space available in Manhattan, with the average price per square foot increasing from $324 to $767 between 1995 and 2004. There is also more general evidence that people with higher incomes buy up more and more space, rather than being content with what they've got. If rich people really liked apples, firms would probably just produce more, or produce special luxury apples, maybe rebranding them with some bullshit label to make it seem like there was something else, I don't know. But that can't be the case for housing, because the amount of space, especially in the most desirable areas, is limited, so the price gets bid up out of the reach of poor people, fueling inequality even further and producing gentrification and homelessness. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. We can add to our table that housing is mostly actually land or location, whereas apples, um, aren't land or location? Yes, that will do. Let's move on to the final point in our table. Something you might have noticed about housing or land is that people don't buy it just to use it. It's a financial investment. This is for a few reasons. Unlike apples, housing is not perishable, and land is permanent, which makes it good insurance for financial institutions. Houses are also relatively costly, so even in the old days they could store a lot of value. And there has been a political goal of home ownership which has inflated prices since the 1980s, with banks willing to extend credit as long as house prices keep rising. Economist Cameron Murray has detailed how housing as an investment creates perverse incentives. Because developers can sit on existing land and wait for the price to rise, it might actually be more profitable to hoard than to build and sell housing. Prices rise higher, the effective supply remains low, and both of these things contribute to the housing crisis. But here's the best thing about this. One problem with taxes is that they often increase prices, and you might be worried that the land tax I mentioned earlier would just make housing less affordable. But according to Murray, charging developers land taxes would make it more expensive to postpone building, and encourage them to bring forward development. This is because they know they're going to get charged on land whether they build or not so they need to bring money in as soon as possible in order to pay the tax. Murray looks at a case in Queensland, Australia, where a charge very similar to a land tax was increased and finds it had no effect on the price, but increased the amount of housing available. And if you're a leftist who feels like land taxes sound too technocratic, just remember that they were proposed in the Communist Manifesto, the most left-wing thing ever to exist. So to return to our table one final time, we can see that the housing market doesn't work partly because housing is a good with poor market feedback mechanisms, partly because it's intertwined with land and location, creating monopoly elements, and partly because of its status as a financial investment. We can also see some ideas fall out of this, like taxes on landowners and the rich, and strict regulation of owners and middlemen. Plus, the money raised from this could be used to help solve the problem directly, for example by building social housing or giving houses to homeless people, an approach that's been shown to work in some places. But one question remains. Do we, as Oli and Mexi claim, need to abolish the housing market? And what would that mean? Later on in his video, Oli gives his main proposal, that landlords should have their property forcibly acquisitioned, that people should not be allowed to profit from home ownership, and that control of housing should be devolved to communes. I don't disagree entirely with the principles behind these ideas, or even the end goal, but it strikes me as kind of simplistic, and this leads to some errors. Let's start with the big one. There is no reason to believe that a market in housing inevitably results in a crisis in housing. You know, housing crises are a bit of an Anglo-Saxon thing, at least among the rich countries. There are places where houses are affordable even though they aren't fully socialist, and we can learn from them, but we need to be a bit more systematic. There are serious questions to ask about how housing would work outside the current system. Questions like, who will decide to build housing? Where will they get the materials and labour from? What kind of housing would be prioritised and who says so? Who will fund these decisions? Who will own what bits of the housing and land? And what rights do they have? I want to offer partial answers to these questions with three main proposals. I'm going to draw heavily from the book Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing, which has a number of suggestions in it, ranging from reformist to socialist. I'm going to warn you this final bit will be a little denser than the rest of my video, but honestly, I don't know how else to talk about policy. 
Now, I get that the length and format of Ollie's video meant that not everything could be explored in depth, something that he and Mexi discussed in the stream after the video. In this stream they do float some interesting ideas, but they still don't say enough about how we get from our system to a socialist one, and they also miss what I view as the key distinctions we need to make between housing, land, and finance. For instance, Ollie uses landlord to mean owners of properties rather than land itself. There's nothing wrong with this in itself, as it's the common usage, but in this case it matters for his proposal to take their property without paying them. In his view, they've already received compensation via the rent they've paid in the past. And if it's already canon that people can have their property expropriated for a new mall, it's surely not that much of a leap to say they could be expropriated so people could actually live in them? Only this time the money for that forced buyout would be all the rent that's already been paid over the whole time the series has been running. Who would the big losers be? Rich landlords, banks who got people into debt, and people who were using property to launder money. Data on this are hard to come by, but some data from the US suggests that many landlords use their properties just to make a living, and actually have similar incomes to their tenants. You can believe the social role of landlords is a bad thing while still acknowledging some people depend on it. It's just like people who work in the fossil fuel industry. Sure, they're part of an exploitative system, but it doesn't mean they are individually rich, and any transition needs to acknowledge the disruption to their lives. If we're looking to move towards forms of collective ownership that don't rely on the state, then my first proposal would be more local initiatives like community land trusts in the UK, where members democratically own the organisation, which itself owns land and develops affordable housing in response to the needs of the community. Now this is a room with electricity, but it has too much electricity, so I don't know, you might want to wear a hat. Over the long term I'd like to see these grow, but right now they're just too small to make a dent in the land market in richer areas and cities. My second proposal would therefore be for the government itself to start buying and leasing land. In South Korea there's a government owned entity called the Korean Land Corporation and it buys, sells and develops on land. Creating similar entities that had the power of compulsory purchase, and that's with compensation, would allow them to put land to good use, and would put pressure on the landowners who weren't. This could have similar benefits to a land tax, including reducing speculation and raising revenue, but it would not penalise the ownership, construction and maintenance of the actual homes. For the third and final proposal, people could also retake control of finance, and the case of the British bank Northern Rock gives us some hints as to how. Northern Rock used to be what's called a building society. Actually, it used to be several different building societies. These organisations were owned by members to pool their money and help them finance building their homes. They would sometimes even dissolve automatically after all their members had done so. The wave of deregulation starting in the 1980s turned many building societies into modern banks, which meant that they were free to do terrible, terrible things with their money. Northern Rock famously went bust in 2007 after overextending itself and had to be bailed out by the government. Then in 2015, Northern Rock had its assets bought up by US investment fund Cerberus Capital Management. Cerberus. Even capitalists themselves can see how much of a joke this all is. Financial institutions that are owned by their members, like building societies, are known as mutualist. Countries with more mutualist financial institutions such as Germany, Austria and Switzerland are notable for their low debt levels and functioning housing sectors, as well as the fact that the lending which does take place isn't into speculative real estate bubbles. So, if the government and local authorities control the land and various community-owned organisations finance and build the housing, likely further supported by the government, does this count as abolishing the housing market? My answer is honestly, who cares? It's already a radical first step towards overcoming the housing crisis, and if it turned out the remaining market mechanisms were leading to problems, then over time we could experiment with moving towards other ways of allocating housing, some of which Oli and Mexi discussed. But more than anything, I'm hoping this video gave some solid economic foundations for what's wrong with the current system and how we might change it. Next time I will discuss the issue of state ownership versus private ownership in more detail, with reference to a slightly different, though strangely linked case. Well guys, thanks for listening all the way through. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and also hit the bell for notifications. Because apparently that's an extra thing you have to do now, which makes sense. Why would saying you like a channel and want to see more of its content mean you'd be alerted to said content? You have to tell YouTube that separately, obviously.